Hello and welcome to Financial Education for the Nation. My name's Warren Shu, and today we're going to talk about divorce. Okay, so divorce. Not the most fun subject to talk about, but hey, do you know what? We get together, all good intentions. Unfortunately, for some of us, it doesn't work out and we go our separate ways. And as much as it's tremendously hard on everyone, um, both parties, children and family, everything else, I am a firm believer that you're better off to be happy then just be miserable and live a life that you're not going to be happy with. Um, I think we all need to work at our marriages, um, myself included. But do you know what? Sometimes it's just the inevitable and um, you just can't resolve the differences or what's happened or just the way you've grown and you need to separate. Um, and in 2018, the latest data we've got, there was 90,871 divorces. So 90,871 divorces in England and Wales and a further 6,873 in Scotland. Um, overall, the divorce trend is actually reducing. But my fear, if that's the right language, is that 2020 with the lockdown, with everyone being so close to each other, um, that might buck the trend. So I thought I would do a session on pensions and divorce and how it all works and that kind of thing. Um, for a lot of couples, the pension will represent the largest or one of the largest assets in the family. Um, you've got the family home and you've got the pension. Typically, they're one in two or two in one um, on the list of scale. So it's really important that you get this bit right um, and which is fair and amicable for all parties involved. And there are basically three methods that the courts can use to um, take into account the pension benefits, and they are offsetting, earmarking, and sharing. I'm just going to go through each one to give you an overview of how they work. So offsetting, um, like my other matrimonial assets, simply means you offset the value of the pension against something else in the matrimonial asset. So typically the family home. So you could say, for example, hey, look, you have your pension, I'll have the family home. You know, that's the kind of the thing, the way offsetting works. There would be a capital value to this pension. Um, now, it's typically the fund value for a defined contribution scheme or um, there's different ways you can calculate. It could be the cash equivalent transfer value or the pension entitlement capitalized for a defined benefit scheme. Um, and they would say, say, look, that's the value we're giving the, um, the pension scheme. That's equal to the value of the house. So you have that, I'll have that, that kind of thing. Um, that's how um, offsetting works. Now, offsetting works really well if the divorcing couple are fairly young. OK, both working, no dependents. And that's because, well, we've got lots of time both sides to make up our own pensions. Um, you know, so there's less sort of things in the mix. It's quite easy. It's quite clean. But it's a very clean break. And there are other less things in the mix to worry about. When it doesn't work so well is when one of the parties is very close to retirement because they then don't have time to build up their own pension retirement funds. Um, so it's not always the best way of doing it. Offsetting is a way and it works well typically for the younger generation. OK, but when you're older, it's less attractive because if the pension value is particularly high, um, if we offset, then the other party can't or is unable to have time on their side to direct create their own pension. Or if the pension value is high, it might be bigger than other assets that we can't physically get an equal match. We can't offset against, um, which is it doesn't typically work in the challenge we've got here is it doesn't work well for older couples. And although I said the divorce trend is coming down, the 55 year olds, hey, you guys, you're on the rise. So the 55 year olds are on the rise. So the 55 cohort of individuals are actually more likely to get divorced than the average. So the courts have um, 
the, the ways they look at the the assets, the family. They got the non pension capital, they got the pension assets, and they got the income. Now, where that becomes a bit blurred, you've got non-pension assets, family, home, ice, that kind of thing. You've got your pension assets, your defined contribution pensions, your workplace pensions, your final salary pensions. And then you've got the income um, to consider ongoing income, earnings and such like. Where it becomes a bit blurred, particularly for those 55 and older cohort, is that a defined contribution pension now can also be deemed as capital. Does that make sense? Because it's easy to get full access to the whole pot of money. So it's a lot harder to predict what a judge will order and what they will say um, that will have to happen. Whereas in the, in the past, it was a lot more straightforward, a lot easier um, to do those things. So offsettings, the first one to the oldest one, is simply when you've got one asset and you offset it against another asset in the family home. It's much better for younger generation who've got time to build up their own assets. It's less attractive for the older generation because if one party has little or no pensions and they offset it, they don't have the time on their side to make it up. The second one on the list is called earmarking. Okay, now earmarking um, enables an English or wealth court to tell the pension provider to pay the ex-spouse a pension. So you've got a pension scheme, okay? And what the court does is it writes to the trustees of the pension scheme, it says, We've put in place an earmarking order, read charge, that's another way, like a, a second charge. We put a charge on this pension and we order you to pay the spouse a pension. Now, <laughs> I really don't like this one, okay? I really don't like this one. Let me explain. One reason it's not a clean break. I'm all about clean breaks. Um, if you're going to separate and divorce, let's just get on with our lives, both parties, don't allow someone to be beholden to the other. That's control. That's vindictive. It's malicious. It's not nice. Allow both parties to become successful and to prosper and get on and enjoy their life. But with an earmarking order, the courts put a, a charge, basically, an, an order to the trustee to say, when the member retires, they should share X percentage. Let's say 50-50. It, it could be any percentage. But let's share, say, 50-50. Now, if we think this through that member might become vindictive or malicious and say, well, actually, I'm never going to take benefits from this scheme. I'm just not going to bother. And that means the ex-spouse won't get a pension income. Bizarre, isn't it? Um, they might also say, well, I'm heavily funding this scheme now, but I'm heavily funding it and half of it's going to go to my ex-spouse. So I'm going to stop funding it altogether and we'll just leave it paid up and then they'll get less than they expected. Also, the ex-spouse has no control over how that money is invested. So the member might take some foolish, risky investment decisions um, because they kind of feel that only half of it, in this example, is ever at risk. And it just doesn't really sit well with me at all. And the last thing is, it's ridiculous that the income is taxed on the member and not on the ex-spouse. So although they've got a pension promise to receive an income, it's taxed on the member. So if the member's a high or higher rate or even an additional rate taxpayer, and the member is a non or basic rate, sorry, if the spouse is a non or basic rate, they're really going to get disadvantaged by paying a higher amount of tax than they unnecessarily need to. So it's a real, real tricky one. Um, you know, the, I, I don't really like at all. Um, I really don't. It, it, it's it, the only time it works really in its favor when it's really, really advantageous is when the ex-spouse is very close or particularly in retirement. Does that make sense? So they're in retirement, they get a, a sharing order, they, they're receiving their pension, they now have to, um, sorry, they get an earmarking order, they have to um, pay that money out. They have to pay that money out. So um, it makes more sense to do it that way. So you're very, very close um, and you're actually receiving the pension income, which makes it more um, beneficial. So it's only when you're really at retirement that I would really want to consider that option. Other times, it doesn't allow for a clean break um, and doesn't even allow for remarriage either of the spouse, which is ridiculous. So, um, yeah, enough on that earmarking. We can kind of almost ignore it, but just so you know that there is an option there. And it's only really advantageous for when you're in retirement or exceptionally close to retirement. 
And then the third option um, is a pension sharing order. Now a pension sharing order, unlike the earmarking order, the earmarking order is you will pay this pension income to the ex-spouse when you retire. A sharing order basically says, hey, look, let's split the pension in two, for example, and let's share it between you. Okay, so it's a nice clean break. So they get a pension in their own right. So they say, okay, you've got, let's say, round figures. We've got a million pounds in this pension scheme. It could be a hundred thousand pounds. Let's split it. And this is going to say 50-50. Now the ex-spouse has to set up a pension to receive this transfer. And it's a transfer in this example of half of it. It could be any percentage. So it's a nice clean break, separate. The ex-spouse then gets to manage the money how they want to manage it. They get to retire when they want to retire within legislation rules. Um, and it gets taxed on them because it's their pension when they receive it. So it's a much cleaner, simpler way of doing it. Um, the earmarking board doesn't like remarriage. So this option, hey, everyone's free to go and do what they want. They can go and get remarried and do whatever they want. Um, and it's a very attractive clean break. I'm all into the clean break. The offsetting is nice, but the downside about the offsetting of the first option is it means the um, non-member, the ex-spouse, doesn't get a pension. The earmarking always keeps a tie there, always keeps a relationship, which I don't like because it doesn't allow both of you to go off and do your own thing. Whereas the pension sharing order says, hey, look, okay, look, let's yeah, either sell that home, get rid of it, do this, or you offset the family home against the holiday home or the other assets. Let's split this pension in two and let's split it and just each have your own share of it. So it allows people to go on that. Where it's not attractive is if the main two assets are the family home and the pension and the, the ex-spouse wants to keep the family home, the matrimonial home for the children and everything else, or even because they just love it, you can't really share that pension because if they're equal, one has to get one and one has to get the other. Then you've got the offsetting option. But um, that's why there are three. That's why there are three. So they all work well. My my preferred option is the sharing option because you split it, you both go away with a pension. However, if the only two main assets are the family home and the pension and it doesn't allow you to share it and it's really important to the ex-spouse they keep that family home, then um, the offsetting is a good alternative. But really the only time I'd look at earmarking would be if you are in retirement or within, I want to say like in retirement, that's the only time I'd really look at it. Okay, so that's the three pension options. A little bit sort of down, different, bit specialist this this um, this week, but you know, gives you an idea of what is available um, to broaden your personal finance knowledge. So five things this week, we're gonna stick on to pension, uh, sorry, divorce. So five things in relation to the divorce. So I found this quite fascinating when I was writing my article, I thought, oh, do you know what, this is interesting. So I say that all this is also on the warrantute.com blog. So you can go and get all the details on that as well. Um, according to recent divorce statistics, 42% of marriages end in divorce, uh, which means 58% of them succeed. That's the way I would look at it, really. Heart, glass half full. So 58% of them succeed. And remember, mar uh, divorces is on the decline overall. However, we do have that cohort of 55-year-olds um, whereby it is on the increase. I guess they're kind of just done their career, they're done their work, and children are leaving or left home, and they're trying to think, do you know what, there's more to life. I want to go and do this, this, and this. And the other spouse says, well, actually, I'm very happy doing this, this, and this. So they just sort of drift apart. Um, the average duration of a marriage uh, among opposite sex couples who divorced in 2018 was 12 and a half years. Um, so that's pretty impressive, you know, 12 and a half years. Um, my wife and I have been together, um, God, I shouldn't say this live, should I, on uh, recording since 1995. So that's a fair old innings, I've got to say. Uh, the longest uh, marriage in history is 84 years 84 years that's pretty impressive i must say the average uh cost of a divorce is 1500 pounds 1500 pounds was a lot less um than a lot of people um make out i think really the costs escalate when you can't agree on a settlement and it goes to court the average age for a divorce 
with uh, opposite sex couples in 2018 was 47 for men and 46 for women. So um, right smack bang in the period of time where I am. I'm 46. So um, yeah, interesting. Very happily married. I'll be all right. Um, and then uh, the last one, which was just more a bit of fun, really. The largest divorce settlement in history was between Jeff Bezos. Now, hopefully, if you've been listening to this podcast for some time, that name is familiar. Even if you can't just say who, who he is or where he's from, he's the founder of Amazon, along with his wife, Mackenzie. They did found the company together, um, and she received a 4% stake in Amazon. So it wasn't equal. Um, a 4% stake in Amazon, and at the time, it was worth $35 billion. That's with a B, folks, $35 billion. Now, the way Amazon stock has traded since um, that time, I reckon she's probably on track to being around about $50 billion today, maybe even higher. So, um, yeah, pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, it doesn't always have to be equal. <laughs> um, in the news this week, so uh, the money Monetary Policy Committee member, Gertrude Viga, Predicted a jump in unemployment once the furlough scheme ends. Yeah, kind of makes sense. We understood that. It's not going to, you know, tell us anything we don't know. Um, we could push joblessness back over 7.5% target, what the Bank of England have predicted. So Bank of England have got this 7.5% 7 target. He reckons it might go over that 7.5%. Um, and he's also, which is really important, he's backed the possibility of negative interest rates. Um, and he said it would help stimulate the economy. Um, there's growing empirical evidence that suggests that negative interest rates have not been counterproductive to the aims of the monetary policy in other countries. So what he's saying there is, hey, look, when unemployment rises, what we need to do is stimulate the economy. We need to get it going. Think of the economy as a fire, okay? When it's smoldering, it's about to go out. So we have to do something to f get it going, fire it up. And with a fire, you blow air or oxygen into it to stimulate those flames. But then when those flames go, you then have to put wood on and stuff to get it going. With an economy, you have to stimulate it first. And one of the things he's suggesting is, look, let's stimulate it with negative interest rates, get those flames going, because that will make them, people take money out of their bank accounts because they're getting charged for holding it there, and they will invest it. They'll either invest it in the stock market or they'll invest it in their homes, or they'll just go out spending on holidays. They'll think, this is silly. It's costing me money. This costs me money to keep the money in the bank. I'm just going to go spend it. I'm going to have a cruise. I'm going to extend my house. That then stimulates the economy. That's booming the economy, and therefore things pick up. If you imagine people start spending on holidays, people are spending on their house, we need more plumbers, the plumbing company takes on an apprentice, someone's got a job. The supply shop who's selling all the fittings needs more help behind the desk to do that. Um, you know, they need more IT, so the IT company who supports them recruit more IT people to work in the IT support company. More sales people get employed to sell more goods to these stores, etc. And the knock-on effect is those goods have to be produced. So that's how the economy works. But it only works if it's moving. And the biggest worry that Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, has is if the economy completely stagnates. Because then it's like a fire that goes out. Then you have to almost start over again. So what he's looking to do is keep that economy going. If unemployment goes above their expected target, they will have some things that they can do now. I've always done quantitative easing, which is basically where they print money and put it into the economy. They buy bonds. Um, but that means that money goes into the system. People feel a bit more wealthier. They then spend that money. Um, and it's all about keeping the economy going. What he's talking about here is putting interest rates to a minus. So we're at 0.1 now. Put them at a negative. So you get charged to keep your money in the bank. And therefore, you can pull the money out there. But remember, folks, really in the bank, you really should only have your emergency cash and planned exp excuse me, planned expenditure over the next three years. Otherwise, you should really be investing it. Second thing in the news, staying on the economy, really, China has reported the economy has expanded by 4.9% in the third quarter compared to a year earlier. This is just shy of its pre-pandemic pace. Um, many other countries are still in a recession. And what you've got with China is they've veed. They've gone deep in and they've rebounded straight back out. And um, you watch this space, folks. You know, China is the 
growing economy, it will surpass America. I never make you know factual predictions like that because um, it's the future. But you, it's got everything going for it in respect of um, a booming economy. Um, and America doesn't like it. And Donald Trump particularly doesn't like it. So, um, but yeah, it's out. It's it's growing. It's V'd out straight away. Right. Just a couple of readers or listeners questions this week. Um, I want to move house. Should I sell my current house or should I let it out? Okay. The housing market is booming, particularly at the lower end. Okay. First time buyers in the middle end, stuff like that. It's booming in, in the re... It, it's shocking, really, because you've got rising unemployment, okay? We've got pandemic, so fear of uncertainty, what's going on. And we've got Brexit two months away, you know, the actual final exit of European Union and the UK. And the housing market's booming. It's just like, it's bizarre. And the only thing I can think it is, is that the um, first time buyer is saying, hey, look, I've got an opportunity here to buy a house with no stamp duty. I'm going to take that. That then encourages the person to sell, encourage the person to buy. One person's purchase is another person's sale. They move on up the ladder and that's what's causing it. So Rishi Sunak has done a great job of making sure it's it's stimulated. Um, but going back to the question, should you sell or rent? My money's on selling. It really is, you know, it's my, my preference for you would be to sell your property Take as much of the equity you could to your new property. Buy the biggest home you can comfortably afford or the most expensive home you can comfortably afford um, and put as much money down so you borrow as little as possible. And then you consistently work on repaying that mortgage and funding your retirement plan over the following years until you reach retirement. And then you'll be fate left with a home of similar value repaid, a nice big pension scheme fully funded, and then you can possibly downsize your home, release the equity tax-free, enjoy that along with your retirement fund. Um, houses, I think, buy tax are a little bit overrated. Um, they're heavily taxed, and we covered this in a previous episode. Um, they're a single investment, so it's very, very concentrated risk. And if you get a rubbish tenant in there, it's hard work. It really is, so um, I shouldn't bother. <clears throat> Second question, should I arrange a mirror will or should I go and use a property trust within my will? Okay, leaving everything to your spouse on your death is risky. And the reason I say that is because your spouse may remarry, they may go bankrupt, they may be sued, or other hostile creditors. Say, for example, they might need long-term care. Okay, and what this simply means is if everything's in their estate at that time, your share of assets that you want to go to your children are now in their estate. And when it's in their estate, it's at risk. So if they remarry and heaven bid they were to die, then all of your assets and theirs will go to the new spouse. And it might then go down to his or her children as opposed to your children. So putting a simple property trust in there is not inheritance tax efficient. Okay, it's nothing to do about inheritance tax planning here. This is all about controlling the direction of your money and where it should go. So by putting a property trust in there, it means that in the event of you passing away, your share of the family home will go into trust. The survivor is able to control that share of the property, but is never 100% entitled to it. So for example, if they decide to move house, they can move and they can downsize, okay? When they downsize, if they released a hundred thousand pounds, for example, half would go to the survivor because they own half the house. Half would go into the trust because the trust owns half the house. They're allowed the income from that half, but they're not allowed the capital because the capital is protected for your beneficiaries, and your beneficiaries typically are your children. It's a very simple, very vanilla um, legal way of ensuring that your estate, your assets can pass, pass the people that you want it to. Um, it doesn't just have to be property. You can have your main home, you can have rental properties, you can have other assets as well, you, any investments that you want. Anything can go into trust and the, the surviving spouse is entitled to the income or the lifetime interest in that, but not the capital. Um, and it just protects it then to go down to the children. <clears throat> Very, very, very important to do. So, Smarter Spender. I get this section sponsored by Idelo, the price comparison website, because I genuinely, 
I think they're great. I think they're fantastic. Even way before they sponsored the show, I mentioned in my book, I've used them for a long time. My children use them and I always do. And I now track prices of things that I want to buy. Um, so I thought, what better to share this every week with you? Uh, they come up with some data for me and they've told me that game pads are down 10% uh, the, uh, cheaper this week than last. Um, garden benches are down 22%. So forward thinking, do you want a garden bench in your garden for next year? Is it worth getting, getting the cover, getting it now? So you're nearly getting it 25% discount, uh, which is amazing. Uh, barbecues are 11% down and printers are 12% down. But a good thing to look at buying this week is dishwashers. So dishwashers are much cheaper this week than they have been previously. And you can save around about £30 on the same model. But what they think people will be buying are fireworks and outdoor um, supplies because we've got fireworks coming up. And obviously with the um, uh, social distancing, we're unlikely to be going to any fireworks place. So fireworks are on their top list for people buying this week. But go and check out their website and download their app. It is very good. This has been Financial Education for the Nation. My name is Warren Shute. Thank you for listening. Please continue sending me your questions. I do read them all and respond to them all and hopefully get them listed on this show. And until next time, stay safe and look after yourself.